Welcome. Good afternoon. It is uh, Wednesday, April 14th. Um, welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are going to be looking at um, S7 regarding expungement, which is a bill that we've been working on for quite some time right now. And um, we have with us um, Attorney Bryn Hare. I thought it would be helpful for the committee to get a very high level uh, kind of walkthrough overview of the bill. Um, reminder of where this bill came from, the genesis of the bill, um, and then review some of the testimony that we that we heard um, and uh, in reference to the bill and, and how, how that testimony fits. And then, um, and then we do also have a memo from the um, Office of the Executive Director of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, because there is a policy decision that we have to, um, have to make in the bill. And so we'll look at that um, as well. So with that, welcome, Bryn. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, committee. <clears throat> For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, so I will follow your lead on the best way to get started, but it sounds like maybe uh, the high level overview of the bill, just like a return to the bill and do a high level walkthrough again might be a good way to start. Yeah, and actually, maybe actually tell like, where did this come from? Where? Um, sure. Yeah. Sure. So um, I'll just remind the committee, we talked about this when I first did the walkthrough. Um, the genesis of the bill, as, as you know, it passed the Senate last year um, before, um, actually, I think it was after the shutdown, but it, it did pass the Senate last year. And the genesis of the bill last year was um, Act Number 32 of 2019, was a, an expungement and sealing bill that the legislature passed um, that directed the Sentencing Commission to um, conduct like a comprehensive assessment of the sealing and expungement statutes and um, identify other crimes that should be eligible for sealing or expungement. As the committee is aware, there's only a, there's a pretty short list of crimes right now that are eligible for sealing or expungement. Um, um, I shouldn't say pretty short, but it's primarily misdemeanors are eligible for sealing or expungement. And then you do have a list of a few felonies that are eligible now. <clears throat> so, uh, the Sentencing Commission in 2019 undertook this kind of big project, which was to take a look at, take a comprehensive look at Vermont um, and how Vermont deals with sealing or ex and expungement and identify what other crimes should be eligible. How should Vermont do this in a way that is um, more, that provides more access to sealing or expungement? So um, the commission issued their report in the fall of 2019, and the report is is where this bill came from. Uh, this bill really uh, codifies the report's uh, recommendations for the legislature. So <clears throat> in their report, as you know, they recommended that most crimes be eligible for sealing or expungement, excluding, um, excluding certain crimes. And as we know, that's the um, drug trafficking, drug trafficking offenses and the listed crimes. <clears throat> So part of the commission's report was to establish the, this sort of tiered system for when offenses are eligible for sealing and when they are eligible for expungement, if at all, um, qualified, qualifying offenses, of course. Um, and that is partially why, this, why the um, S7 is a pretty complex piece of legislation, is because the sentencing re commission's report um, established a pretty complex way of dealing with um, criminal offenses and, and whether they should be sealed or expunged or both. Um, so I hope that's I hope that's helpful. Um, I'll pause here to see if there are other questions about that before I before I go into S seven. <clears throat> Seeing any, but that that is that is very helpful. Um, and was that. Um, I forget if it was a if there was a minority opinion or if it was pretty much majority of the sentencing commission or that, no there wasn't a, a minority report as far as I'm aware. <clears throat> Great, thank you, uh, Tom. Listed listed offenses uh, where I should be able to just find it, but uh, where do I find the listed offenses? 
Yeah, that. So it's funny because I should have that uh, memorized as well. But it's in Title Thirteen. Um. <laughs> I wonder if there's another witness on that can jump in. No, there's not, is there? Um, I will email it to the committee. It's just, I can't remember the um, citation for the listed crimes. It's, it's generally all of the um, violent offenses are listed crimes, as, as you probably know. But um, I can, I'll send you guys the link to the statute as soon as I'm done here. Right, and what's on my mind is, are, are the sexual offenses on there? Yes. Okay, and that would be, that would include uh, women and children and uh, all the above, I guess. I don't know what you mean by that. Um, well, I, I'm. I mean, we've dealt a lot in the, in the last couple of years with uh, well, some with sexual offenses as far as women goes, and and of course with the ICAC stuff. So um, I, I guess I'll wait till I till I see. Uh, <laughs> see the list and, and I might be able to pose my question um, a little better. Representative Colburn just very handily pointed out that section one of the bill is the, <laughs> is the list of crime statute. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> that was, that was just to give credit, credit is due. That was representative Donnelly, but you oh. helped me realize that I had just um, at, inadvertently recycled my cheat sheet of the <laughs> 12 crimes that I have been keeping on the back of an envelope. So I was able to retrieve it from the recycling. Anyway, thank you, whoever. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say it's Monday or late Friday, unfortunately. <laughs> no, nope. Just Wednesday. Oh. <laughs> Zoom time, as, as we were saying. So. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to, I'll go into the bill then. <clears throat> um, so I'm not going to, I won't do a section by section walkthrough. It sounds like maybe the committee doesn't need that level. Um, but I'll just remind you that section one is the list of crime statute. And we've just got some uh, technical corrections there that were recommended by the sentencing commission as a part of its report on expungement. Um, section two, this is the surcharge provision. So this is essentially implementing a provision that passed last year that allows surcharges to be waived by judges for expungement and sealing proceedings if the petitioner um, demonstrates an inability to pay. Um, section three is the definitions in the expungement chapter. So we're changing the definitions of the crimes that qualify for sealing or expungement to um, include any criminal offense except for those listed crimes that are found in section one and drug trafficking offenses. Um, it defines qualifying property offense because that's one of the categories um, that the, the next section identifies for sealing or expungement. And it also defines subsequent offense, which um, is a phrase that appears throughout the bill. So I'm gonna go to section four now, um, so that's a, if, unless I see some questions, because this is really the, the heart of the bill that um, sets out the procedure for sealing or expungement based on the category of offense. Right, so, so Brittany, either now at a, or at some point, but I noticed that um, most of the bill says sealing, expungement and sealing or expungement or sealing. So, if, so at some point, if you can, yeah, and that's really what I was going to talk about now in section four, because um, section four is where the bill sets out what offenses are eligible for sealing and not expungement, what offenses are eligible for sealing and then later expungement, and then what offenses are eligible um, for expungement right off the bat. Um, so we do, we, we don't refer to them interchangeably. Um, there is, it is very specific within the statute, what is eligible for what. Okay. So section four, um, I guess I'll start out with uh, page nine, that new language at the bottom of page nine. I think you're gonna, I think this is what the, um, the memo from the uh, Office of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs is about, that language that provides that um, the prosecutor who prosecuted the case has to be the one who stipulates to a petition to seal or expunge that's filed earlier than what the statute provides for. So I won't go into that. 
think you're going to talk about that later. Well, yeah, actually, um, I am going to ask you while you're okay. Um, where do you know where that language came from? So that language was a request of um, the Office of States Attorneys and Sheriffs um, in the Senate. Okay. Thank you. So that did not appear in the bill as it passed the Senate last year. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, okay. Sorry. Where, where, where's that language? Are you talking about number two, subsection two? Yep, it's subdivision two. It's subdivision A two on the bottom of page nine. So, so when you go and you say that, Bryn, does that mean that um, all that means? It's not the individual that prosecuted before. It's just the state's attorney office is going to come back and prosecute again, correct? It's the office that prosecuted the case. Um, yeah, okay, maybe. thank you. But prior to this language, it could, could be that office or the attorney general's office, correct? Correct. Okay, and do you understand why the, why the change, why that was asked? Um, I believe it's because the bill establishes this provision throughout this next section that we're going to go through that provides that um, for an earlier uh, hearing, if the person um, files for expungement or sealing before the statute, the statutory time frame has elapsed, um, that is allowed as long as the prosecutor stipulates to that petition. So um, because that's a new, that's a new policy set out in the, in the, statute. I think that there was um, some desire on the part of the state's attorneys to ensure that it was, um, if they had prosecuted the case, they would be the one who was reviewing the petition, um, as opposed to the attorney general's office. And I think I mentioned before that there, I think that um, the state's attorneys raised in the Senate the concern about the expungement clinics um, that were held where um, the attorney general was reviewing those petitions. Thank you, uh, Martin. So uh, while we're on this section, um, can't, can't we put something in there that uh, uh, along the lines, on, unless the state's attorney has delegated the authority to the AG? I, I would think, it, I, mean, I don't like how absolute it is. Even if the state's attorney wants to allow the AG to make these decisions at one of those clinics, this would prohibit that. But um, I, I just want to flag that as a possibility that might make this more acceptable. Could the attorney general delegate or? No, th that the state's attorney can it's essentially different. agree that the AG uh, can make that call. Um, I think that you could, you could come up with some language that would provide that in limited circumstances, they could waive their, um, the requirement that they be the one to um, stipulate to the petition. Yeah, so, I mean, something like that along those lines and maybe David Shear can weigh in on precisely how that would work. But I, I know that from my mm -hmm. understanding and, and having participated at one of these clinics that uh, some state's attorneys essentially informally uh, say to the AG that, yeah, you can go ahead and, and take care of these for us. So, but this provision here would forbid that. So allowing that flexibility, I think might be a way to make this a tolerable provision. Okay. Um, hmm. I'm looking for the for current law. Is it is it just what's what's not underlined in in two, or are we missing? Because they have concurrent jurisdiction now. You are, will you say what you mean by current law? Do you mean about this? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah right. I, think that, I think it is just there in two that provides that the respondent is either 
prosecute prosecuting office. Okay. Yeah, and I think that David could explain that. Yeah, I, I think it's concurrent jurisdiction, but perhaps it's just out of courtesy uh, that at these clinics, the AG clears it, you know, with if they're in Chittenden County, clears it with the Chittenden County prosecutor, for instance. But David can tell me if I'm misremembering that. Okay, all right, thanks. Sorry, Barbara. Barbara, go ahead. So by us leaving the um, state attorney's request in there, it sort of goes against one of our committee principles of geographic justice. And that concerns me. <laughs> where an argument for it going to the AG's office is it would be uniformly handled. Okay, thanks, thank you. All right, we'll, we'll come back to, to this section. Okay, thank you, Rin. Okay, um, so I'm gonna move on to page 10 now um, and talk about the new language in the subdivision five. <clears throat> and this is the provision, this was not in the bill as passed the Senate last year, but it was added this year in the Senate. Um, and this is that specific uh, provision for that applies to people who um, served a term of probation with payment of restitution as a condition of that probation. Um, and once they've completed their probation, this, this language allows them to petition the court to um, adjust the waiting period, the statutory waiting period for sealing or expungement as set out in the statute. Um, and the idea there was that if, if um, a person is on probation until they've paid their restitution, they may be on probation for a very long time as they, as they make payments towards their restitution. And so um, this would allow them to petition the court and say, I'm supposed to wait you know, eight years from the date that I've completed my sentence, but because I've been on probation so long, I'm um, petitioning the court to adjust that waiting period um, just in these specific uh, circumstances. And I believe you heard testimony that the um, that courts really don't impose restitution as a condition of probation anymore. So this is probably going to apply to a pretty limited subset of people. Um, Moving forward, Is that okay? And does this, or, or could this um, section be seen as um, one of the areas that raises um, DOC's concerns? So I I'm, I hesitate to speak for the department, but con conceivably. Um, because it would allow a person to petition to have their record expunged um, prior to the statutory waiting periods, which are triggered by the completion of the sentence um, or the completion of a subsequent offense sentence, um, it, it could be, yes. I mean, from, what, from how I understood uh, the department to be characterizing their concerns, um, one of them was that if a person is serving a, serving a sentence for a subsequent offense, um, it concerned them that they could then have a prior uh, conviction expunged. Okay, thank you. Do folks understand that? Or want to explain again? Or yeah, uh, um, Bryn, could you just do a hypothetical on it? I'm pretty sure I understand it, but I, I guess a hypothetical situation and with a hypothetical crime. Um, on, on how it, what it might look like, I guess. And, so, and even, and maybe even a little uh, uh, commentary on how uh, uh, DOC uh, may not be favorable. So um, my understanding, and I don't, again, I'm just gonna preface this by saying I'm not speaking for the department. I don't want sure. to speak for the department, but um, my, I understand from the testimony I heard was that one of the concerns was the, potential situation where a person who was serving an incarcerative sentence for a different crime 
was able to petition the court to have a prior conviction expunged. And um, that was concerning to the department for a few reasons. They talked about risk assessments um, and I think they talked more generally about um, being concerned about being able to evaluate a person for their likelihood of reoffense once they're released. So um, I'll get the hypothetical I'll give is that um, should apply throughout the bill, not just specifically to this subsection five, but throughout the bill, there's a provision that a person can petition the court prior to the date that their, con their conviction is eligible for expungement. They can petition the court for expungement or sealing prior to that date. And if the prosecutor's office stipulates to that petition, then the court can go ahead and grant that sealing or expungement. So that means that a person, because the um, statutory timeframes in S7 are tied to the date the person completes their, um, satisfies the judgment for their offense, be it the offense they're seeking expungement for or, the, or a subsequent offense, whichever is later. So if a person, say a person um, commits a petty larceny and they're trying to get their petty larceny um, conviction expunged, but they later um, commit a, another offense and they are serving an incarcerative sentence for that other offense, mm -hmm. um, they can petition the court to um, have that earlier conviction expunged ahead of, uh, ahead of schedule, ahead of the timeframes that are set out in the statute. So if the prosecutor's office stipula stipulates to that petition, then a person could conceivably be serving an incarcerative sentence and have an earlier conviction expunged while they are serving that incarcerative sentence. So um, that's my understanding of one of the areas that the department was concerned about. Sure, yeah, yeah, I can certainly understand that. Uh, to me, expungement uh, is, uh, I guess in a sense, a reward, I guess, for uh, you know, lack of better term, is to, to me, it's a reward for, for good behavior, I guess. And, you know, it's so people can, you know, get on with their lives. But um, if, if somebody has committed another crime, um, I, it, it's all, I, I don't, personally, I just don't understand the reward after committing another crime, even though it's not the same crime, but um, it, maybe it's something we can talk about, or I think it's something we are going to talk about, it sounds like, going forward, especially, um, um, concerning the issues DOC may have with it. So, all right, thank you. Great. Okay. Yeah, not, not seeing any other hands. Okay, thank you. Shall I keep going then? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the remainder of this section sets out those tiers of offenses and how, um, and how Vermont is going to handle sealing or expungement for various tiers of offenses. <clears throat> so the first one is at the bottom of page 10, subsection B. These are um, qualifying non-predicate misdemeanors and possession of a controlled substance offenses. So um, this may be considered, you could consider this like the lowest level of offense. And for these, expungement is really the default, but the court may seal these offenses if it chooses in the interest of justice. So um, you can see that. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I was gonna have you um, remind us about predicate and non-predicate offenses. Sure, so non-predicate offenses are offenses for which um, a later offense can't be uh, levied to um, increase the sentence for a later offense. So maybe I should say what a predicate offense is. And this is also defined in the bill. So it's a criminal offense that can be used to enhance a sentence for a later conviction. And so it would include things like a DUI conviction is a, is a predicate offense. A later DUI conviction um, can result in a greater penalty uh, if you have a prior DUI conviction. So non-predicate offenses are offenses for which there's, um, there's not an enhanced sentence if you, if you commit the same offense again later. So, so with the DUIs, if you have a DUI one and it's been 10 years, it can't be used to increase the sentence, right or wrong? Right. So,
Um, so the bill handles DUI separately from every from other types of offenses. So we're going to get to that in a minute. We can talk about that when we get there. Okay. Um, so these non-predicate misdemeanors and possession of a controlled substance offenses um, are eligible for expungement uh, five years after the date the person satisfies uh, the judgment for the offense. Um, or if the person commits a later offense, a subsequent offense, the date on which the person satisfied the judgment for the subsequent offense, whichever is later. So essentially the person has to have five years clear of no additional offenses, and then they're eligible to have the offense expunged. Um, but also I just wanna point out that there is a provision that if the court finds that um, a sealing would better serve the interest of justice, the court can order that the record be sealed rather than expunged. So, oh, I'm sorry, does anybody else have there? Nobody else does. So uh, after five years, uh, expungement can be considered. Um, I, I guess, why wouldn't it be considered if somebody had been, uh, you know, had met all the stipulations? We, I'm sorry, I have another phone ringing and I, can you just repeat that question for me? Sure, sure. Yeah, so at, uh, after five years, uh, expungement can be considered. Mm -hmm. And so why, why wouldn't expungement be, be granted um, if somebody had um, followed all the uh, recommendations and stipulations? Right, so as long as the person is eligible, they for other reasons that are enumerated in the statute, then the court will grant the expungement. That's the way that it's set up. Um, okay. Yes. But again, I, I was just pointing out that provision about sealing because I know there were some questions about when do we seal and when do we expunge. Um, so I just wanted to, to make it clear that sealing is also available for these offenses if in the judge's discretion, that would better serve the interest of justice. And also the prosecutor can make an argument that sealing better serves the interest of justice. At, at the hearing. And that's current law, right? That's current law, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and while we're, while we're, oh wait, not yet, I guess, sorry. Later on, I wanna point some, I wanna point out a, a typo in the bill that I need to fix. <clears throat> so we're ready to move on to subsection C. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to page 12. Um, Subsection C, now we're gonna move on to the qualifying predicate misdemeanors. Um, and again, DUIs are handled separately, but um, qualifying predicate misdemeanors, sealing is the default for these offenses. Um, so the, it provides that the court shall grant the petition in order that the record be sealed if um, five years have elapsed since the person satisfied the judgment. So it's again, again a five year waiting period or um, if the person committed a subsequent offense, then five years from the date on which the person completed their sentence for that subsequent offense. And then if you look to page 13, um, it also provides that, um, oh, I, I just wanna point out on page 13, line 13, um, you see the word expungement there, that should be sealing that I need to, that's a correction I need to make if um, the committee decides to amend the bill. I have made a note of that. I just wanted to point that out for the committee. So, so Bryn, I think actually this would be a, a good time to either reiterate the hypothetical that you said again, or another hypothetical that, um, you know, would explain this, the default of, of sealing. Because I think there, I think there might be an impression that sealing isn't done all that often. Um, right, so this is really a new, this is new policy here, um, different from existing law. So predicate, offense, predicate misdemeanor offenses aren't eligible for expungement currently. So um, S7 would open it up to sealing eligibility for predicate misdemeanor offenses. Um, again, within that, you have to wait five years from the time you complete your sentence. Um, and then if you look to page 14, it provides that um, those offenses are, are eligible for expungement five years after the sealing order. 
if the person hasn't committed any subsequent offense from the time that the um, original conviction was sealed. So um, using that hypothetical, um, if a person um, commits uh, some pr uh, predicate misdemeanor offense, I'm, I'm blanking on one right now, um, they could be eligible to have that offense sealed five years later from the date that they completed their sentence for that predicate misdemeanor. Um, if they commit a, another offense during that five years, then they have to wait five years from the date that they've completed the sentence for that, for that subsequent offense. And then the record is eligible for sealing. And then if they don't commit, so if, say they, they petition the court and the court grants the petition to seal that, um, that underlying predicate misdemeanor offense, um, as long as the person doesn't commit any other offense, five years from the date of the sealing order, they can then petition the court um, to have the record expunged. So essentially that would be 10 years, um, 10 years free of committing any offenses. Um, would they be eligible to have that record expunged? And again, um, this, the provision applies. I just want to point out that throughout the provision applies that if a person petitions the court early prior to that um, statutory time frame and the, the prosecutor stipulates to the petition, they can have it um, sealed or expunged early. But again, that would be if the prosecutor stipulates to that early petition. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna, should I keep going? Okay. So um, I'm on page 14 now, and then subsection G, this is the DUI offenses provision. And the bill really doesn't change um, the way sealing or expungement happens for DUIs in a substantive way. Um, what it provides for is that a person can have um, a DUI conviction sealed 10 years after um, the date that the person completed their sentence for that conviction. So no substantive changes to the existing law there. Um, and I can answer questions about that if, if there yeah, are. Um, I just wondering if those DUIs, is that automatically sealed or does it have to be petitioned? No, it has to be petitioned. Okay. And, and how do you do that? <laughs> um, Asking for a friend. <laughs> um, you know, I can I can send you I can send you some links to how how that process unfolds if that would be helpful. It would. Okay. Thank you. I'll do that. Uh, Ken, why were the DUI offenses ten years and uh, other offenses were only five? You know, when when the legislature passed Act Thirty Two in in twenty nineteen, there was quite a bit of conversation about um, about opening up access to sealing for DUI offenses, because currently they're not um, eligible for sealing or expungement. Um, so the idea is that it's really a, it, you know, it, it was a policy decision based on um, the idea that DUI offenses are predicate offenses um, and that they are seen as a public safety uh, type of offense. So um, they had a the legislature established a longer time frame, a longer look back, if you will, um, for for DUI offenses than for other offenses. But okay, all right, I I answered my own question. Thank you, uh, Selena, and then Tom. Also, I was the reporter for that bill. And I think also at the time we heard some testimony from the Department of Public Safety that without sort of allowing the a certain window of look back time in case there were subsequent offenses that we would be um, putting perhaps some federal funding at risk that they use for highway safety. 
things. So that was, I think DPS was helping us to weigh in and figure out how to structure that in a way that, um, that they would be, you know, that would, that would not create that issue. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Tom. And then yeah, Tom. and I think the, the first number that was thrown around a, uh, a few years ago, I think it was, we, were, we had talked 20 years. And, uh, and it, when, when, uh, a couple of years ago when we passed this, it, it got knocked back to 10, so. Thanks. I, think, I think the other thing with that was, um, uh, was, was I was pretty uh, staunch in, in uh, because I think at first it started with DWI with it was just alcohol and I didn't like that. And where I was uh, just going back with Bryn when I was going to ask a question is when I went back there and I see it's now DU, DUI, which I don't think I caught that before. So now that covers all categories, if I understand that right, which I think I do. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Yep, driving under the influence means the, under the influence of any intoxicant. Yeah, um, the other thing while, I, while I've just started is, 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 it, is it down further somewhere um, where the commercial driver's, uh, driver's license is dealt with more by chance? So it doesn't apply to people with a CDL. Um, it'll, it, so those those uh, CDL licenses are carved out of this eligibility. And that I think was also due to a federal funding issue. Carved out, so that means, that means they can't be expunged, they can't be nothing, right? Right, correct. They do not apply to DUIs on a commercial driver's license. I wonder if that has maybe since changed or been looked at if you have if you have been for uh, clean for 10 years or if there's an, uh, if there is an another uh, violation for the simple reason is you served your time you you know all kinds of things that we've been gone uh, that we've done and the need for for uh, drivers as long as they're safe. Right, um, I can I can look into that. I know the Senate, um, probably also the House, heard testimony from the from the DMV about this provision um, in 2019. So it was you know three years ago there was a there was federal funding tied to this CDL issue, and that's why they were carved out. But that may have changed in the prior three years. I don't know. Thank you. Okay, great. Keep going. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to skip through over the burglary offenses. Um, burglary offenses are dealt with um, separately from other from other crimes, and that's a 15 year look back time frame. Um, no substantive changes to that in S7. So I'll turn to page 16. Um, which is the qualifying property offenses that are defined earlier in the bill, and also the selling, dispensation, or transport of regulated substances. Um, so this, for this category of crimes, uh, sealing again is the default. These are eligible for sealing eight years after the person completed their sentence, um, or eight years after the person completed a later, um, the a sentence for a later offense, whichever is later. Um, and then the, it also provides on page 17 that um, the offenses, these offenses are later eligible for expungement. But I wanna point out on page 17 um, that again, I have a, an error here that needs to be corrected. Line four on page 17 refers to expungement. That should say ceiling. Um, and then it's the next subdivision, subdivision two right below it that um, provides that these sealed records for these types of offenses are eligible for expungement eight years later um, after the sealing order, as long as the person doesn't com commit any subsequent offense. 
So we've got eight years um, ceiling eligible, and then eight years after that, as long as there's no subsequent offense, then they're eligible for expungement for this category of offenses. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So subset, subdivision J is qualifying felonies. Um, and these are all felonies that don't fall in any of the earlier categories. Um, and these are eligible for sealing um, 10 years after the date the person completes uh, the sentence or 10 years from the date that the person um, completes their sentence for a later offense, if they do commit a later offense, and they are not eligible for expungement. So all of these other felonies that are not property offenses um, are not expungement eligible, only sealing eligible with the 10 year look back. So that completes that section of the bill. Those are the various categories of offenses and how the Sentencing Commission recommended that Vermont um, open eligibility for offenses to either be sealed or expunged and on what time frames. Right, and, and so it looks like a number of these new provisions sealing is a default, is that? Yes, um, yes. I, I think the majority of them sealing is the default, except, um, or, or at least sealing happens first, and then there's a longer wait period for, um, for the offense to be eligible for expungement. But the only one that is eligible for expungement right off the bat is the first one, which is that non-predicate misdemeanor um, and possession of, of controlled substances offenses. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay. So I'll keep going through the bill then. We've got section five, um, which is the effective ceiling statute. And this is that provision on the bottom of page 18 um, that clarifies that courts have to make a reasonable effort to notify individuals with a sealed record that they may, um, that offense may be eligible for expungement later on. And then we've got the, what does reasonable effort mean? That means first class mail, last known phone number. And then section six, sealing of records for individuals 21 or older, um, or I'm sorry, and younger. So under current law, youth under 21 shall have their juvenile records sealed. Um, two years after their final discharge, if the, if the individual wasn't convicted of a listed crime and the court is satisfied with their rehabilitation. So the change here raises that age to 24. So individuals um, up to 24 are eligible to have that offense sealed um, and also changes it so that as long as the person hasn't committed a listed offense um, ten, within 10 years of their application to seal, um, and then the other criteria are met, then they are eligible. So it raises the age and also um, kind of broadens eligibility for sealing a little bit. And then- Thank you. Um, oh. I also just, I, I, I think the um, current law on the effect of sealing is important that um, the order shall be legally effective immediately and the person whose record is sealed should be treated in all respects as if he or she had never been arrested, convicted, et cetera. Oh, right, and the eligible or the effective sealing statute. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, just to talk about the, the corollary, which is the effective expungement statute, um, that statute provides that once a, a record, a criminal history record is expunged, all um, records of it have to be destroyed. But um, I wanted to remind the committee that there is a requirement that the court maintain a special index of cases that have been expunged. Um, and the special index is, includes only certain data points like the person's name and date of birth and the um, docket number. And I think the conviction, what the conviction was. And there's limited access to that, uh, that special index. Um, and I think the access is only for the person whose record it is, and also for research purposes, the, um, the court can allow access to the special index. So if somebody who's had their record expunged um, is applying for a job and um, 
and their future employer found on the internet that this person um, um, you know, had been convicted of a crime, could that person petition the court um, you know, for proof that um, from the special index that the fact I'm punished? Yeah, I believe so, because the statute provides that the person has access to this to the special index. Um, so for if the employer called, the court would have to say no record exists, but if the person were able to access it themselves and provide it to their employer, I think that would be an option. Okay, because I know we hear concern with expungement that that um, would not be possible for somebody possibly entering the military or who is in line for, um, for a new job, but it, it sounds like that really is, is not a concern under current law. Um, so I guess I would respond to that by saying this, that the committees did hear, have heard testimony about those concerns over the years as you worked on sealing and expungement. And that's part of the reason why you've created that language um, that gives judges the discretion to order that uh, record be sealed rather than expunged in the interest of justice. Um, so that is an option also, um, but then you also did work on that language about the special index and you ensured that the person themselves would have access to that, to that um, indexed record as well. But you may want to, I mean, it, it may make sense to hear from the courts about that specific point since they would know better. Thank you, uh, Barbara. So Bryn, I was gonna ask you, um, if somebody produces a subpoena for a sealed record, would that be permitted if it's a valid subpoena? Um, so this, the effective sealing statute provides that it can be, um, the, a sealed record can be used um, for a later um, adjudication. It can be used by any entity that has that, um, that sealed file. Um, so that typically is going to apply for, to like the prosecutor's office. We'll have access to those records. Um, so it isn't on par with expungement because if it were truly expunged, right, the person the, gets a fresh start. Right, the prosecutors retain access to those um, for, for a limited purpose um, if the record is sealed. But again, if it's expunged, then that, that access isn't there. Um, and in looking at the Collateral Consequences Resource Center, it looks like half the states that seal and expunge give law enforcement access to sealed records? That Would sounds... I, I mean, that sounds right to me. I, I, I don't want to confirm or deny that because I haven't done that reading. But. Sure, but would this bill, where is this bill on law enforcement access? So I think that law enforcement access includes the prosecutor. Prosecutors are considered law enforcement for purposes of enforcement of the criminal statutes. Is that what How you mean? About, no, I mean, you get stopped by a police officer and they, want to check and see if you have had priors. I see. Um, so I don't believe that Vermont allows for, for, um, uh, for a law enforcement officer to access those sealed records immediately. Um, I, but I would like to confirm that before I say it unequivocally. Okay, and if they would have access through a subpoena. Um, the other thing is, what if, somehow um, somebody violates this, whatever we choose to do, and gives information, is there any relief that a um, victim of it being released would have in terms of damages? I mean, I realize that's more civil, but like, mm -hmm. is that something that we would need to put in the bill if we wanted to make sure, you know, there's not a, yeah, they have a record, you know? Right record or um so i'm not sure i think there th there could be a civil um cause of action depending on what kind of statement is asserted about the person um but if you mean if a an entity violates their um like for example if the court did not respond um 
to an inquiry in accordance with the statute? Is is that what you mean, or? I was thinking more if, um, again, I read that a lot of these private um, clearance companies that people hire to do the clearances for them get lazy about updating their um, database. So let's say they say that Kate has a record when really last year she got her record expunged or sealed and she didn't get the job because somebody was careless. Right. I think um, I'm going to respond by saying I imagine that there it's possible that there could be civil damages if um, if Kate could show that um, she suffered um, she suffered some type of damages as a result of that exposure. Um, but again, that's a great question, and I and I I would like to think about it some more and maybe consult with some some experts in that practice area before I respond. Okay. And same thing probably with getting into public housing, if you have a felony sealed or getting a, a federal Pell Grant or something, you know, I just, it feels like the stakes can be high for some of these things. Right, so I, yeah, and I was just quickly looking at the effective expungement statute to make sure I wasn't forgetting some like civil penalty that's put, put into the statute and there is not one. Okay. Thank but again, you. I understand that you're talking more broadly about um, the the private entities that conduct these record searches. I mean, it could be it could be anyone. It could be someone in the state attorney's office. It's a small town, and you know they. I don't know. Like I, I could just see a lot of ways that it could be um, shared if it's sealed. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, well, I can, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, the current law though does talk about who has access to, to sealed records and, it's, and it seems like only people within the particular agency. So, so DPS would have access to, to all the records that they seal. Is that correct? Am I reading that? Um, Correctly, I'm looking at. Yes. Um, yep, that's how that's how I read that as well. That um, any agency that has that record um, can access it if in a in another litigation. Yeah, in terms of accessing, it doesn't it says they have access, right? So it doesn't say right. Anything. Any an entity that possesses a sealed record may continue to use it for any litigation or claim. Um, that arises out of the same incident or occurrence and involves the same defendant. And then a criminal justice agency also um, has, may use those criminal history records um, without limitation for any criminal justice purposes. And then again, those sealed records are admissible um, as evidence for, um, in, during, a, during a prosecution of a predicate, a later predicate offense. Okay, only for predicate offense, okay. But also they are, I'm, I mean, I think that the sentence prior to that, that provides that law enforcement or criminal justice agencies can use it um, without limitation for criminal justice purposes means that it can be used um, in, in a later prosecution, not necessarily <clears throat> just for a predicate offense. Okay, so we heard that, um, we heard testimony about you know, maybe a, the use of force and use of force litigation. And i um, not sure how many of those are really criminal. I always thought they were more unprofessional conduct, but um, but it's, it, it sounds like law enforcement would have access to if there, if there were criminal records regarding use of force. Is that, is that correct? Um, if the record was sealed, yes. Um, and I think, if you're talking about the records, um, the criminal history records of a law enforcement officer um, in a, who, who was adjudicated um, in a criminal court case for the use of force, I would just point out that that um, is, is pretty infrequent. I, the, um, if law enforcement do use force um, and that force is deemed inappropriate, often those are those are either civil proceedings or um, the officer 
is uh, administratively um, determined to have, have uh, violated the use of force policy. Um, so access to sealed or expunged records then probably is not particularly relevant or if it is, it's very rare. I think so. I, that that's my assessment, that if you're talking about records of criminal records of law enforcement officers who um, are criminally prosecuted for using force, I think is pretty, is pretty uncommon. Thank you. Ken. So, Bryn, um, Representative Rachelson just brought up something that uh, made my brain think. What happens if a landlord goes and rents an apartment or building or whatever to someone that's had an expungement or sealed or whatever, that person does something really, really bad in that person's building, is uh, is a landlord held responsible for anything or does the expungement and seal cover cover the landlord for a, for a possible lawsuit of of renting out to uh, to a person that could have been known as bad um, from social media, something like that in the past. And, and now the, um, it could come back to like, um, well, if the landlord would have been paying attention back then or did his homework or something like that, it might've popped up if you Googled or something like that. You know what I'm saying? I hope. I think so. Are you, are you I think that you may be asking a, a, a question about landlord civil liability for the for the decisions that a landlord may make about who he or she chooses to rent to. And if they have, and if they have a record that's been expunged or sealed, and then that person does something horribly wrong. Right. And then, and then um, to a, a new victim, and then the new victim decides to sue the landlord because they should have known that this situation was a problem from years ago. So um, that is a that's an interesting hypothetical. Um, I I am you know off the cuff going to answer it that it sounds like it would probably be a tort claim and the you know the duty of care that is owed by a landlord to their tenants. Um, would probably be satisfied by doing a criminal record check. And if that criminal record check didn't um, reveal any criminal history because that criminal history had been sealed or expunged, uh, I would suspect that that landlord wouldn't, would not uh, have violated their duty um, if, if they did do a criminal background check, if that is a part, if that is a part of uh, how, the, how the landlord conducts their business. Um, do you, is that clear? I mean, I think that the idea is that the, if, if a record is sealed or expunged, people don't have access to it in general. Um, so a landlord wouldn't uh, have access to it. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, but I'm saying the way society is now that it's like, I, I, I just have a concern that it could go back even further than that. And it was like a public record at one time and and then um, the current victim could go up, go after a landlord that he should have known better, even though it was expunged and sealed. That's all. It's a concern. I see. So is that sounds like less of a question for me and more of a statement. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, bear with me as I'm asking this question. I'm, I'm trying to listen and, and go through the language of this bill and I, I, my brain is getting a little jumbled. So I'm looking at page 19, um, section six, talking about sealing of records. And Bryn, you were just 
read, it seemed like reading off some statutory language related to the sealing of records and how it could be used. And I'm wondering if, if the language you were referencing is, is in the bill in front of us, or is that from a different section of the statute? It's from a different section. I mean, it's the same section of law, but it's not in the bill. It appears where those like the ellipses are um, on line okay. nine. That's where that language appears in existing law. So it's the exceptions to um, to the effect of a sealing order. So that list of exceptions provides for who can have access to a, a sealed record, despite the fact that it's sealed. Um, so if you if you look online at 30, 33 VSA 519 uh, sub C, you'll see that language. Okay, and so does that like because the language that's in this bill, the way that it reads is like is essentially some version of like if something is sealed, all that will be available is this like indexed information, which is you know the name, date of birth, and the subject of the file, um, the docket number, and then it lists the people who could have access. Um, it says that the special index shall be confidential and may be accessed only for purposes for which a department or agency may request to unseal a file. Um, so the, the language that's in the bill seems like, in theory, very narrow, but are you saying this other section, and I can go back and look at the other language, are you saying this other section is more, expan is more expansive? Yes, so I would say yes, the language in the rest of the statute um, just fleshes this out a lot more and we do legislative council does this a lot we don't put in the full statute if we're not making any changes to a certain part of the statute. But in this case, it may have been helpful if that uh, language about exceptions was was there in the bill for the committee to reference as you're as you're working through these issues. Um, so, yes, I would I would. I would uh, characterize the language that's in subsection C, which is, does not appear in the bill, to be more expansive than, than the language in E that provides for who has access to the special index. Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, and then I guess maybe this is a question for, I'm not sure if this is a question for you, but it makes me curious about so within the sections that we have, again, a uh, department or agency may request to unseal a file does it, do folks know, like, I'm curious what that process is like. Is that a simple process? Is that a complex process? Like, when we're talking about unsealing a file, I'll try to get a sense of what that means. So um, the court administrator's office may have testified to this um, in previous years that, that the legislature has worked on the expungement and sealing statutes, um, but I, it was technical enough in nature that I am not, um, I don't remember. And you may want to hear from them about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin. So I just have a much more, I guess, basic question. Um, why, why don't we have our own uh, impact of sealing records under the expungement? and? have to refer to this statute that really deals with juvenile records as I understand it. Uh, is, am I missing something there? I mean, 5119 is, you know, it's Title 33, it's Human Services. I, I do understand that, okay, we have this kind of restrictions on when people can access sealed records, but it's in the context, it's in a different context. I understand there may be some overlap, but I guess I'm just not understanding why we don't have a whole separate, here's the impact and here's the restrictions on the use of sealed records when those are records that have uh, been sealed under the expungement statute. So we do have um, a statute that deals with the effect of sealing. Is that what you mean? Because that, that's in section five. And again, much of that, uh, much of that statute doesn't actually appear in the bill, just a part of it, because um, the only part that you were changing was the part about notice, um, notice to individuals who've had their oh, records. Okay. So, so, so section six is only dealing with the juvenile records that are seen. That's right. 
Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Must be afternoon after a, you know, a nice day and nice lunch and warm weather that confused me. Thank you. Well, the the title is almost the same. Yeah, there are two yeah, totally right. separate titles. So. Okay, so should I just talk about section seven and eight quickly, and then? Sure. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, Section seven is that automatic um, expungement provision for those judicial bureau offenses. Um, and I do think that you heard some testimony from um, Judge Grierson about some proposed changes to that section. Um, and then section eight is the sentencing commission directive. And I just wanted to point out that this, um, this section also did not appear in the Senate passed bill last year. But um, the Senate added it this year uh, to specifically address um, the issue of sealing and expungement and when we use which and whether it's overly complex um, because the directive is really for the Sentencing Commission to decide whether or not Vermont should carry on with using this two track process of sealing and expungement or if um, it should simplify the process into a one, a one track system, either sealing or expungement. <clears throat> and it also um, specifically asked the commission to look at uh, a way to make this um, an automated process or a petitionless process um, rather than this um, pretty, pretty complicated petition process for sealing and expungement. And I know that you've, and I, I just wanted to point that out because I know you've heard some testimony from witnesses about the complexity of the statute. So. The Senate also recognized that and when it added this language. Right, and I know we took testimony on sort of the dates and what happens, what happens when. Um, I think the bill goes into effect before the, before the report is due and that, that seemed fine with the Sentencing Commission and others. That's my understanding. Yeah, I think um, the idea was that they would report back in time for the legislature to craft another ceiling and expungement bill next year. Okay, great. I suppose we can't put this bill on the wall until we see that. I'm only kidding, of course. Okay. Well, that, that was really helpful. I'm not sure if other folks feel the same, but I think it was incredibly helpful. Thank you, Brynn, especially in terms of some of the, um, some of the concerns that we've, that we've heard. Um, and um, so again, in terms of access, um, DOC does not have access to the special index, correct? Um, the special index of expunged files, no, they do not. <clears throat> I'm just um, reviewing the, the who has access to sealed records. Um, and I know I read a little bit of that language earlier, but I just wanted to point out that um, criminal justice agencies um, are defined as all Vermont courts and other governmental agencies or subunits that allocate at least 50% of the agency's annual appropriation to criminal justice purposes. So um, I would read that to mean that the Department of Corrections would have access um, to sealed records. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Okay, any questions for Bryn on, on the bill? Okay, so um, Britt, anything else you wanted to add in terms of some of the, uh, oh, sorry, Barbara. Bryn, did the Senate hear from any national advocacy groups or other states at all, or did they really just focus on Vermont? You know, you know um, I can't remember about last year in 2020. I think I want, I think that they may have heard from CSG on the expungement bill 
in 2020, but I, I'm not positive about that. Okay. Um, they don't always put up their testimony, I've noticed. But okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Chair Grant, I wasn't sure if right now, like, if I just have general questions about the bill, is this the time for that? Or is it just, are we just sort of like reading through right now and we'll have more discussion later? Yeah, go, go, go for it. Yeah. I guess I'm, I guess I, I think I have some research and homework to do. <laughs> I probably have a lot of questions, but I guess the initial question is, um, I, you know, there's no, my understanding is currently for listed crimes, there's like, zero safety hatch there's like no there's no pathway to ceiling there's no pathway to expungement am i understanding that that's correctly? true now that's true now and it's also true under s7 okay and i guess i guess you know this isn't maybe a question for Bryn. i think this is more of a policy question i guess i guess i'm i'm curious about that you know if being new to this discussion, I, I'm not sure, you know, has that been discussed, like building in some sort of mechanism? Um, you know, I think in part expungement is, you know, uh, as Representative Burdett was describing it, can, can be viewed as like, you know, you've done you've done you served your time you've done well like you know some sort of like reward so to speak but I guess when I think about expungement I also think about it in the context of systemic racism and oppression and the fact that the you know the courts have disproportionately impacted certain people and it's a mechanism for allowing people to be freed from that system that may have done them a disservice and there's not a lot of avenues to do that and so I think my concern is that you might have people who have listed crimes, uh, you know, on their record, who uh, uh, do not pose any kind of risk, and who who may have, in fact, been charged due to a variety of systemic issues that um, are oppressive in nature, and and they currently have almost no avenue to be freed from that, and that concerns me. So I guess I just want to drop drop that out there. Um, may I respond just to that and to Representative Rachelson's point earlier point, which I may have made it, um, I just wanted to correct myself. And that is that the Senate did hear um, from CSG's Justice Center about sort of issues related to collateral consequences of conviction and expungement and sealing. Um, and in the course of hearing about this bill. And also um, they did hear testimony that they're um, from the Justice Center that listed offenses are people who commit listed offenses are often people who don't wind up committing any more offenses afterwards. Um, and so that was part of the reason that the Senate put in the language uh, directive to the Sentencing Commission to look at expanding access to listed crimes um, in their report during the interim. So that can be found on page 23, lines 15 to 17, make um, all criminal offenses eligible for sealing or expungement except for big 12 offenses. So still, still not all offenses, but many listed offenses. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So it's something that we're just sort of like slow, slow walking a little bit. Then we're, we're taking a deeper look into. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, Martin. Yeah, I just wanted to note that the uh, <clears throat> Sentencing Commission subcommittee last year did start talking about this very issue, uh, Kate, and in, in looking at uh, expanding it to everything except for the Big 12. So, so they have looked at this before, but they decided to keep it a little narrower uh, and looking for the incremental change that we can definitely get through uh, because that one's going to be the biggest challenge to, to extend it to, to violent crimes. So, uh, so yeah, it has been discussed and I'm sure it will be discussed again when the subcommittee takes it up again this fall. Great. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. And um, go ahead, Brim. That's all I have. I think that's really the end of the bill, except for the effective date, which was July 1 of this year. Okay. Great. Thank you. And in terms of my list, I think you 
you um, answered it all. I didn't know if there was anything else in terms of testimony that um, that we had heard that that you wanted to respond to, or I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I unfortunately wasn't. I didn't see all of the testimony that you heard. I don't think I did see some of it, um, but um, if there are specific questions for for me to respond to some some testimony, feel free to ask, and I'll let you know if I heard it. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, and no, this is, I thought this was very, very helpful. Um, so we do have that that one section where we have differences of uh, opinions with the state's attorneys and the um, attorney general's office. We do, we do have the written um, testimony from the state's attorneys and sheriffs um, explaining why, um, why they wanted to change the language. Um, which is, and I had that email to um, to all of you since we um, this is how this is how the state's attorneys chose to submit their testimony do it in writing. Um, so, well, um, but Martin, you also um, said that you'd like to have David Share come back and discuss this. Well, I mean, I just threw out a kind of a compromise. I, I'm kind of with Barbara as well on this, as far as uh, having the AG be involved uh, may address some of the geographic justice concerns and, and the disparities around the state. Um, but then again, uh, on the other side of that scale is the local knowledge that a state's attorney might have about uh, victims on some of these crimes, particularly when we're extending to extending to crimes that definitely have victims, even though it's a lot, a lot of the property crimes, uh, that that consideration is important as well. So I, I proposed just something that a little bit of a compromise doesn't quite take care of the geographic justice concern, but definitely allows the AG to have a bigger role. And if, if people are interested in that as a possible compromise, then yeah, I would like to hear from David. So, so, Brynn, is it correct that um, that the new language just grants the authority to waive the waiting period, so it doesn't do anything in terms of the concurrent jurisdiction? That's right. It's really specific to when a person petitions prior to the date that they're uh, eligible, according to the statute. That's when it when it limits um, the respondent to just the prosecuting office that prosecuted the underlying conviction. Okay, I'm just. Okay, well, let's, um, I'd like to think about this, about this more. Because um, what's got, um, and the impact on geographic justice and, and the distinction between, between the language regarding waiving the time frame um, as opposed to waiving the actual expungement, who, who handles the expungement. I have one question on that as far as if, if we want to hear any from anybody else. I know one individual who's testified a lot before on geographic justice issues is Bobby Sands. I don't know if this is the kind of issue that we would want him to weigh in on whether this kind of thing would help or not. I, I, don't, I just don't know if this is outside of his ballywick or not. Okay, you can find out. Okay. All right. Well, great. I'm not seeing any other questions. So I think we'll, we'll call it a day. <laughs> um, it's helpful. We'll get back to um, S3 tomorrow morning. And it sounds like we're going to have a long day on the floor. So I don't have anything scheduled um, in the morning. We're also hearing from um, folks from the um, Special Investigative Union, I'm forgetting exactly where, but I think Bob up in your, your area. Um, hearing from Jennifer Pullman, so that, that, should, be, that should be interesting. Um, so any other questions before we adjourn?